Okay, we will be in Numbers chapter 13 tonight. And, um, you know, about the first 10 chapters of Numbers, I guess, can be a little bit dry, maybe. It's one of those, if you're going through your quiet time, maybe you can, you can just kind of go through it and say, oh, kind of looking forward to the next chapter. I'm not into the genealogies too much. But by the time you get to chapter 11, it starts getting pretty interesting. And so tonight, we're in chapter 13, and in my opinion, it starts to get really interesting uh, as we uh, look at where the Lord has brought the children of Israel. He's, he's bringing them to a place we will later know as Kadesh Barnea, and he's just taking them to this place where they're about uh, to go and, and uh, possibly possess the promised land. With that, let's jump in. Verse 1, And the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Send men to spy out the land of Canaan, which I am giving to the children of Israel. From each tribe of their fathers you shall send a man, every one a leader among them. So Moses sent from the wilderness of Paran, according to the command of the Lord, all of the men who were heads of the children of Israel. Now, these were their names. Now, as we get into these names, just one of the things that I want to point out is these are not the same 12 men that were appointed as chiefs of the tribes. These would be uh, some that would, would have been uh, more likely warriors, uh, able to go in and, and look at the land. And as they're sent into the land to spy it out, really what this is, this is a reconnaissance mission that they are being sent in for. And uh, we'll talk more about that as we get into this. Um, as we go through these names, I'll, I, I just want you to know that they are, their names do have meaning, so we'll look at them as we go through them here. Um, verse 4, now these were their names from the tribe of Reuben, Shemua, the son of Zakur. And I'm, just, I'm not going to look at all the names, just the, the spy that's going in. Shemua would be the spy. His name, by the way, does not mean killer whale. So it's, it means renowned. Um, from the tribe of Simeon, Shaphat, the son of Hori. Um, Shaphat's name means judged. From the tribe of Judah, Caleb, the son of Jephunneh. Um, Caleb's name either means forcible or dog, uh, depending on uh, uh, who, you, who you read. From the tribe of Issachar, Igal, the son of Joseph. And Igal's name means avenger, or he redeems. From the tribe of Ephraim, Hoshea, the son of Nun. Uh, if you have King James, it says Oshea, uh, which means delivered or salvation. From the tribe of Benjamin, Palti, the son of Raphu. Palti's name means delivered or my deliverance. From the tribe of Zebulon, Gadiel, the son of Sodi. Uh, his name means God is my fortune. From the tribe of Joseph, that is from the tribe of Manasseh, Gadi, the son of Susi, not, not Susie, Susi. Uh, his name means my fortune. From the tribe of Asher, oh, no, no, back up, verse 12. From the tribe of Dan, Amiel, the son of Gemali, and Amiel's name means my kinsman is God. From the tribe of Asher, Sether, the son of Michael. Sether's name means hidden. From the tribe of Naphtali, Nabi, the son of Vafshi. Vafsi. Um, his name means hidden or occult. And finally, from the tribe of Gad, uh, Geuel, the son of Machai. Uh, Geuel's name means majesty of God. So if we just look at their names as we go through them, they mean renowned, judged, forcible, avenger or re redeemer, deliverer, salvation, delivered my deliverance. And it, so as we look at these first set of names here, it, you know, just their names, it's like, it sounds like, man, these guys are warriors. These guys are going in and, and, and there's going to be a, a battle here and it's going to be a good one. And then Gadiel, God is my fortune. Gadi, my fortune. Amiel, my kinsman is God. Sether, hidden. Nabi, hidden. Uh, Oracle, uh, Geuel, Majesty of God. So it, it's almost like there's these bold men who are going to rely on the Lord, but unfortunately what they do is going to 
belied their names here. Um, then these are the names of the men whom, uh, whom Moses sent to spy out the land. And Moses called Hoshea, the son of Nun, Joshua. Now we have already met Joshua previously, uh, starting in Exodus. And his name means now, as it is given uh, Joshua or Jehoshua, Jehovah saved or Jehovah's salvation. But when we first met Joshua, he successfully led the battle against Amalek, the people they're about to go uh, and spy out the land against currently. That's who's going to be in the land as the Amalekites. It was Joshua who went up to the mountain of God with Moses and coming down from the mountain heard the, the tumult in the camp and concluded that it was a sound of war in the camp. So this just kind of gives you his mindset. You know, everything is, is war to Joshua. He's a warrior. And Joshua, up until this time, we have seen him serving faithfully in the background. But it appears now that Moses has taken enough of a notice of Joshua that's not like, ah, oh, what's, what's that guy's name? You know, that, that one that went up to me with the mountain. He gives him a nickname. You know, so just by virtue of the fact he gives him a nickname, it kind of indicates that now he's, he's taken uh, the notice of Moses for whatever reason. And I think it's just because his character stood out from just the rest of the congregation. But this is our first indication that God is raising Joshua up for something much greater. And if, uh, if you are somewhat familiar with the Bible, then you already know it's going to be Joshua who ends up leading the children of Israel into the promised land and not Moses. And uh, tonight we're actually going to look um, at some of this and we're going to start to see the development of that taking place. Now as we get into verse 17... We're going to look at this mission that the spies are being sent on. Now, as we look, we see that um, there's something in particular they're supposed to do. Now, how many of you guys were in the military, uh, men or women? How many were you were in the military? All right, excellent. Now, if you were in the military, what is the job of a spy? What is it? What is he supposed to do? I'm sorry? Yes, gather information, gather intelligence about the enemy. So what is the purpose of gathering intelligence? It's to know your enemy's strongholds and his weak points. And so that's really what the purpose of this mission is intended to be. Now, why is this done? It's to best know how to carry out the invasion. That's the purpose of it. That's, that's the reason uh, for these reconnaissance missions, which is what this is. Verse 17, Then Moses sent them to spy out the land of Canaan and said to them, Go up this way into the south and go up to the mountains and see what the land is like, whether the people who dwell in it are strong or weak, few or many, whether the land they dwell in is good or bad, whether the cities they inhabit are like camps or strongholds, whether the land is rich or poor, and whether there are forests or not, be of good courage and bring some of the fruit of the land. Now the time was the season of the first ripe grapes. So they're sent in and they're told, here's what we want you to check out. We want you to see what the people are like. Are they strong or are they weak? Are they few or are they many? In other words, we want to know how many troops there are, whether they're, they're formidable or whether this is going to be a cakewalk. We, we just want to know what we're up against. And what is the land like? Do they dwell in tents? Do they dwell in fortresses? Is it good land? Is it rocky land? What is it? Is it forest land? You know, these are all tactical questions. These are things they need to know in order to carry out the invasion. And then they tell them, basically, bring back some evidence. We want to see what it produces. And then he tells them, be courageous. Now, these are going to be words that Joshua, when he takes on the leadership of the nation of Israel, he's going to be told a number of times by the Lord, be strong and very courageous. Be courageous. So the spies were sent to gather specific intelligence. Here's what they weren't sent to do. And that was to evaluate the feasibility of an invasion or to decide whether or not there would be an invasion. They were only to bring back information. See, God had already promised back in Exodus to bring the children of Israel to a land flowing with milk and honey 
And this is where the children of Israel were to dispossess the land of its inhabitants. So now this is where they are at. It is the time for the children of Israel um, to step out in obedience to the Lord and to boot out the thugs and send the squatters packing. That's really what they're supposed to do here now because God has already given them this land. He says it's theirs. And you know, here's one of the things that I, that I thought about with this is, you know, God sends them in to spout the land. It wasn't because God needed intelligence. God already knew who and what was there. But I think the children of Israel needed to see beforehand just exactly what it was that they were up against. They needed to have a realistic appraisal of what was there and what awaited them, both good and bad. He's not sending the children of Israel to their destruction. He already knows there's going to be giants there, and we, we will get to that. Now, some people I've heard in the past criticize this decision to send in spies into the, to the land. And they've said, well, you know, that showed that they lacked faith because God had already given them the land. And so why did they bother sending spies? Well, first of all, um, back in verse 2, God told Moses to send in spies. So this was an act of obedience, first of all. But what is done with the intelligence is going to be the real test of faith. It's not whether or not they send in spies. They are being sent so that when they enter the land, they will have a realistic expectation of both the enemy strongholds and the blessings that await them there. Um, several months before my family and I moved to South Dakota from the desert southwest, um, God had already shown us clearly that he was going to be bringing us to South Dakota. So as, as this was being confirmed to my wife and I in our, our quiet times and through changes in circumstances through our authorities and just all the other things that God speaks through, um, we were um, discussing whether or not we should come see South Dakota for the very first time before we moved here or we should just pack up the truck and go basically. And we knew God was going to work out the timing. And so, you know, we just said, well, should, you know, should we do this? Should we go check it out first? And, and um, so that morning after we discussed that, we said, okay, let's, let's pray about it. We prayed about it. And we sat down and just in, in the normal course of my devotions that day, it, it, I was in Psalm 48. And here's what I came to in verse 12. It said, um, as we were praying, Lord, should we go? Should we go see this, this land? Should we go see South Dakota? Should we go see Sioux Falls? And the answer I got was, walk about Zion and go all around her. Count her towers, mark well her bulwarks, consider her palaces, that you may tell it to the generations following. For this is God, our God forever and ever. He will be our guide, even to death. So as, as we got this, um, you know, I read it to Wendy, and uh, I'll never forget her words to me. She said, well, let's go spy out the land. And so I said, okay. But we're going to go to South Dakota to see it, not to make a decision whether or not we're going there. Let's go see the place God's taking us. Let's, and, and so we just said, that's, that's the way we're going to do this. And then I said, you know, and I said, let's, let's just be stupid about this. And what I mean by stupid is we're going to take God at his word from these verses, and we're going to do exactly what this says. So we did. We said, we're going to go, and we're take a lot of pictures, and we're going to take pictures of towers and bulwarks. The first thing we got, uh, did when we got to town, we figured out that you could, uh, from where we were, jump on uh, the interstate going south on, on 29 and then take 229 back up and then 90 over. So you basically could go all around the town and see, see the town from the interstate. So that was the very first thing we did. And then we went in and started just driving around town, finding the main streets and taking pictures of towers and bulwarks. Of course, I had to look up to see what a, a bulwark was first. It's, it's like a buttress on a building, I, I learned. So in case you didn't know that, like I didn't know that. So that's what we did. And um, when we got back to New Mexico, um, you know, we just, and, and when we were talking about it on the way back, um, you know, we just said, you know what, you know, we know we're supposed to come here and it's, it's kind of a cool looking town. We decided 
to come in January, by the way. We're from New Mexico. So we said, we want to see it at its worst. We're not going to wait till June. We're going to go in January. So that's what we did. And I'll never forget the day when we got here. We stepped off the plane at about 5 o'clock, and it was 15 degrees, and the wind was blowing. And I thought, it is so cold here. And I'm thinking now, it's like, that's a pretty nice day that time of year. So, <laughs> but, uh, so we get back. And as on the way back, and, and we were just talking about it, and I said, you know, I, I said, I think, I think what I really liked about South Dakota is I, the people. I just, I just fell in love with the people there. They, you know, just for whatever reason, they were a lot like us. We, we kind of, we, me, I'm, I'm would have been kind of a misfit where I'm from. I lived in a very new age, very liberal community, and and I would be the guy um, walking out my front door to my car in camouflage carrying an armload of guns to go target shooting, you know, and I'm thinking, do I need to hide this, you know, which this would be just normal here. So it's, it's like, but the point is, is we got these pictures of, of these towers and bulwarks and I was showing them to our, our assistant pastor back in Santa Fe. He said, do you see what you've taken pictures of? And I said, no. He says, churches. I said, large, dead, denominational churches and that's when God showed me really what the condition was that there was a lot of dead religion and uh, but about for the next five months I could not get South Dakota out of my mind I was thinking about it all the time you know because I knew that's where we were going there was there was no question before we ever came out here it wasn't 90% certain we knew we were going we just had to see where it was God was taking us but, uh, you know, so for, for us, Sioux Falls is my land of promise. I know this is, this is where God wanted us. You know, and here, um, you know, we've, we face giants. And, you know, we're going to see that this is one of the things that they are up against as they go into the land here. Um, I had to boot one giant out for teaching that there's no such thing as hell. You know, and it wasn't a real giant. He's only about six, seven, I think. Um, but what I really care about is the fruit here. It's, it's the fruit that's in this room. It's the fruit that's back there in those classrooms. And it's the fruit that's, that's outside the wall just waiting to be harvested. Because that's, that's what the Lord has for, for all of us, um, is, is the fruit. You know... Um, there comes up this question, I think, at time to, you know, from time to time, if God is calling you someplace, is it okay to go and, and spy out the land? And, and, and I think it's a good idea. Now, if, if it's a case where you're not sure if God is calling you there, then it's probably a good idea to go and check it out prayerfully and see if that's where God is sending you before you commit to it. There's nothing wrong with saying, oh, we're going to take a short-term mission strip. That's what we're going to do. Now, what is wrong is deciding not to go because you didn't like what you found there. If God has called you, even if you don't like what you see there, he still called you. And if he hasn't called you there, then it's best that you don't go because the, the giants will chew you up if that's the case. Let's move on. Verse 21. I got out of it. Sorry, I got off on a rabbit trail there. But uh, verse 21. So they went up and spied out the land from the wilderness of Zin as far as Rehob near the entrance of Hamath. And they went up through the south and came to Hebron, Ahaman, Shishai, and Talmai, the descendants of Anak, were there. Now Hebron was built seven years before Zoan in Egypt. Then they came to the valley of Eshkol, and there cut down a branch with one cluster of grapes. They carried it between two of them on a pole. They also brought some of the pomegranates and figs. The place was called the valley of Eshkol because of the cluster which the men of Israel cut down there, and they returned from spying out the land after 40 days. So when the spies go there, what is it they find there? First of all, they find four of the descendants of Anak there. Now, these descendants, these are the Anakim. These are giants. That's who these are. So they get there, and among 
uh, the Amalekites, then they see these, these giants, these, these big boys, their secret weapons, if you will. Now, one of the things that liberal scholars will say when they look at this passage is, is that this word that is often translated as giant means bully or feller, uh, like one who fells, not, not like good fellers, uh, but one who fells an enemy. And they're dismissive of the idea that there may have been giants living on the earth at one time. Now, you know, for, you know, maybe some of us, you know, we hear about giants and we think, man, this just sounds like a fairy tale. You know, this is just Jack and the Beanstalk, or that's where Jack and the Beanstalk got stolen from, or what have you. And we're going to talk more about giants later. But here's what we have to realize, is that any time God sends us to a land of promise, there will be giants there. You have to realize that. Now, one of these clusters of grapes they carried between two men on a pole. This happens to be the logo of Israel's Ministry of Tourism. And, you know, so I, I don't know if any of you have ever seen this because this is what, you know, what they're saying, that the land is plentiful. And I've, I haven't seen them, but I've heard that they actually grow some really nice grapes, big grapes in Israel. Um, but the point is, this was the evidence they brought back of the bounty of the land that God had promised them. So when they come back, it's like, uh, okay, not grapes. We're talking grapes, you know. So they bring this back, and the people had to be looking at this, you know, or you would think would be looking at this and saying, uh, we never seen anything like this. We got to go see this. But here's, as we look at these um, few verses here, two facts confront us about the land. There are giant people there, and there's giant fruit there. And when God sends us, the same will likely be true. There's going to be giant people, and there's going to be giant fruit. There's going to be giant opposition, and there's going to be giant blessing. And the question we have to look at is, what are we going to be focused on? Are we going to be looking at the opposition, or are we going to be looking at the fruit? Now know this. What you determine about those giants will decide whether or not you receive the fruit. And whatever you determine about the fruit will decide whether or not you take the giants. See, if we look at the giants, we're going to see giants. But if we look at the fruit, we're going to say, ah, okay, giant, whatever. And that opposition, whatever it is, is not going to matter so much to us. And the question we have to ask ourselves as we look at this is, which is bigger in our mind? Is it the giant or is it the fruit? If it's the giant, you better stay home and work on your relationship with the Lord. And if it's the fruit, then let's go in and kick out some giants. So these guys are in there. They're sent in. They're there for 40 days. Now think about this. this that's not a short period of time that they're in this land among the Anakim. You know, I mean, wouldn't you think that during this period of time they would get somewhat settled in, they'd kind of get an idea of what their habits were, where they lived, uh, what their goings and their comings were. They would say, okay, you know, we're figuring out how we can take these guys. But I think what they're doing is just saying, giants, giants, you know, at least 10 of them are. And this is, interestingly enough, 40 is this number of testing. It's this time that the spies are being tested. It's also the number of days Jesus was in the wilderness as he was being tested. And so we see here this picture then of these spies being tested. And what is going to matter is how they view things once they come through the test. Verse 26. Now they departed and came back to Moses and Aaron and all the congregation of the children of Israel in the wilderness of Paran at Kadesh. They brought back word to them and to all the congregation and showed them the fruit of the land. Now when they told him and said, we went to the land where you sent us, it truly flows with milk and honey, and this is its fruit. Nevertheless, the people who dwell in the land are strong. The cities are fortified and very large. Moreover, we saw the descendants of Anak there. Now let's stop there for a second. Verse 28 starts with the word. They've just talked about this land flowing with milk and honey. They say, nevertheless, but, 
You know, and, and any time the word nevertheless is used or but, basically it just undoes everything that was said just before that. You know, it's like, have you ever had somebody come to you and they, they, they have a, you know, something they need to talk to you about and they say, brother, I really love you, but... And then, you know, it's like, oh, you know, then you don't feel very loved when it's all said and done. And this is kind of what's happening. And as they come in, they say, nevertheless, the people who dwell in the land are strong. The cities are fortified and very large. Moreover, we saw the descendants of Anak there. The Amalekites dwell in the land of the south. And the Hittites and the Jebusites and the Amorites dwell in the mountains of the, and the Canaanites dwell by the sea and along the banks of the Jordan. You know, and I'm thinking, okay, well, you already had victory over the Amalekites once, led by Joshua, one of the guys that went in to spy out the land. I would think that once they received word Joshua was back, they'd be saying, great, let's just give up, let's go home. But the spies instead, they're the ones who are in fear. Now, where they are at then, Kadesh Barnea, this is the edge of the promised land. It's this place of decision they see these big grapes there this big fruit nevertheless so the spies come back and they, re, they, they confirm the report that everything God promised was true but so it's like okay well yeah God said it yeah that's, that's true but you know what I saw with my eyes you know and all but two of the spies are seeing the fortified cities and the giants as being much bigger than the grapes, as near as I can tell. So 10 of these 12 have already defeated themselves before they ever entered the enemy land to take it. They've already decided that they can't take it. So if the children of Israel never would enter the promised land, this would be the last of the grapes they would ever see from it. If they would listen to the 10 which a lot of them are going to, this is it. This is as close to the promised land as they will ever get. This is as much blessing as they will ever see. Verse 30. Then Caleb quieted the people before Moses and said, let us go up at once and take possession for we are well able to overcome it. You know, I love this, Caleb, because he, you know, he gets up there, first of all, he, he hushes the people. Now, remember, there's 600,000 men able, able to wield the sword, basically. 600,000 men over 20 years old. And he gets up there, and he quiets them. And you just got to love his heart, because it's just, he almost presents us like he's saying, giants, schmiants, who cares? He said, we can do this. He's not shaking in his sandals thinking, just point me back to Egypt where I was safe under the taskmaster's whip. He's not thinking that way. He's probably already thinking about which spear to use. He's thinking about how to hamstring them with a short sword so that once they go down, he can bash her head in with a rock or whatever it takes. He's probably already thinking about how he's going to take the giants. He's dealing with that. That's what he's looking at. He's already analyzed his enemy and he knows what it is he needs to do. But more so than that, he knows that God has promised them this land. He's seen the potential for big fruit and is preparing to exploit the vulnerabilities of the enemy. He's not getting caught in the paralysis of analysis, figuring out if there's another land that's going to be easier to take. He's not looking for the consensus of the self-appointed logistics committee to decide the future of the nation of Israel. He's hanging on the promise of God to bring them into a land that is flowing with milk and honey, and he's not willing to let go. He says, we are well able to overcome now, the way this looks in the original language, it is yakol, yakol. Now, one of the things we've learned about the Hebrew language is when a word is repeated twice, it doesn't double its in strength. It increases the strength of that word exponentially. So basically, he's saying, we can do it, we can do it, times infinity and beyond. So, verse 31, but your little ones, oh, wrong chapter, um, we'll get there. Maybe. 
But the men who had gone up with him said, We are not able to go up against the people, for they are stronger than we. And they gave the children of Israel a bad report of the land, which they had spied out, saying, The land through which we have gone as spies is a land that devours its inhabitants. And all the people whom we saw in it are men of great stature. They only listed four. Um, now I guess all the Amalekites are giants as well. Um, but here's what we see. It's a flat-out denial of Caleb's support for the mission. And that equals a flat-out rejection of God because he has already told them he's giving them the land. You know, and this, is, this is the one of the things that, that we have to keep in mind is as the Lord has shown us something that he intends to do through our life. And we know it's the Lord. He's spoken to us through his word. And then we see the giants. And if we say, ah, you know, maybe that's not for me or I'll, I'll, I'll get back to it. You know, that denial of God right there, I mean, that's a denial of God. That's a denial that says, I don't believe God's word. I don't believe he's who he said he is. That's what that is. And so we have to be very careful about that. It's a denial of God's power, which is an assault on the nature of an omnipotent God. So when we deny God's ability to do something, or we question God's ability to do something, we're denying his power. He is able. Now notice that in the beginning of this chapter, it was God who instructed Moses to send the spies. And so right here, we're starting to see that there is an order of authority. And as a result, this report should be brought back, especially if it's a negative report, to the one that sent them. They should be going back to Moses and Aaron, and if they have difficulty with it, saying, um, you know, yeah, here's the grapes, but there's these giants in the land. But instead, they go... They basically take it right to the people. And so in doing so, they circumvent the order of authority, go directly to the children of Israel to dissuade them, and they try to keep them from obeying God's appointed authorities in their life. And also disobeying God. And by doing so, they're going to rob them of God's blessing. So that's the, something we have to be very careful of about who we listen to and we have to look, are they denying the Lord? Are they denying God's authorities in our life? And, and that's, we got to be careful not to listen to those people. And we should check out everything against what God tells us. And we have that right here. We have it in our hands, in his word. Now here's how Moses later relays or tells about the situation turn if you would to Deuteronomy chapter 1 just one book to your right there <clears throat> and Moses is talking <clears throat> to God here and he says and he's just kind of giving the rundown and starting in verse 19 of chapter 1. He says, So we departed from Horeb and we went through all that great and terrible wilderness which you saw on the way to the mountains of the Amorites as the Lord our God had commanded us. Then we came to Kadesh Barnea and I said to you, You have come to the mountains of the Amorites which the Lord our God is giving us. Uh, and actually he's speaking to Israel here. And the Lord, look the Lord your God has set the land before you. Go up and possess it as the Lord God of your father has spoken to you. Do not fear, be discouraged. And every one of you came to me and said, let us send men before us and let them search out the land for us and bring back word to us, by, uh, to us of the way by which we should go up and the cities into which we shall come. So in other words, He's saying, you guys said, you know, tell us which way we're going and tell us, you know, which cities. Tell us, you know, send spies for that purpose. Verse 23, the plan pleased me well. So I took 12 of your men, one man from each tribe, and they departed and went up into the mountains and came to the valley of Eshcol and spied out. They also took some of the fruit of the land in their hands and brought it down to us. And they brought back word to us saying, it is a good land which the Lord our God is giving us. Nevertheless, you would not go up but rebelled against the command of the Lord your God 
And you complained in your tent and said, Because the Lord hates us, he has brought us out of the land of Egypt to deliver us into the hand of the Amorites to destroy us. Where can we go up? Our brethren have discouraged our hearts, true statement, saying, The people are greater and taller than we. The cities are great and fortified up to heaven. Moreover, we have seen the sons of the Anakim there. Then I said to you, Do not be terrified or afraid of them. The Lord your God who goes before you, he will fight for you according to all he did for you in Egypt before your eyes and in the wilderness where you saw how the Lord your God carried you as a man carries a son in all the way that you went until you came to this place. Yet for all that you did not believe the Lord your God who went in the way before you to search out a place for you to pitch your tents to show you the way you should go up in the fire by night and in the cloud by day. So, you know, as we, as we see this, um, Moses is telling the children of Israel, look, you know, you guys, we sent in the spies, your brothers discouraged you, and this is what's kept you out. This is keeping you from entering the promised land. Now, verse uh, 33, let's, let's just move on. Verse, not sure how far we're going to get tonight. Um, there we saw the giants. The descendants of Anak came from the giants. And we were like grasshoppers in our own sight, and so we were in their sight. Now, some of your translations may say, there we saw the Nephilim. Now, that's probably the better rendering of that. Now, the Nephilim were giants. The word Nephilim um, means the fallen ones. These would be the the. The, the sons of God, the, the angels that were booted out of heaven, the one-third that rebelled. That's who this is, uh, the Nephilim there. Now, interesting note about who the Nephilim are. Moses, as he's writing in Genesis chapter 6, says this, starting in verse 4. This is talking about looking back to before the flood. Moses writing from a post-Diluvian time frame, in other words, after the, the flood. And he's writing, he says, There were giants on the earth in those days, and also afterward, when the sons of God came into the daughters of men, and they bore children to them. Those were the mighty men who were of old, men of renown. Then the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually and the Lord was sorry that he had made man on the earth and he was grieved in his heart so the Lord said I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth both man and beast creeping things and birds of the air for I am sorry that I have made them but Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord this is the genealogy of Noah Noah was a just man perfect in his generations Noah walked with God so as, as we look at this, we see that these sons of God came and they, they took wives of the daughters of men and they produce a corrupted or defiled offspring. Now, the word says that the giants were in the land then and also afterward. The point in time that they're referring to is the flood. Where it says here that Noah was perfect in his generations, in the Hebrew it can also mean he was undefiled in his posterity. So this may not just mean that Noah was the only righteous man living on the earth at the time. It may also mean that Noah, for whatever reason, did not have any of this contaminated bloodline that had, been, that had contaminated mankind by the, the fallen angels. Now... You know, you might be looking at this and saying, you know, this is kind of weird. But if you go through and you look at this, this occurrence of the, the name for these people, the sons of God, throughout Scripture, you will see that in Job, the sons of God came and presented themselves before the Lord, this being the angels. So the Benah, Benahai Elohim is the phrase in the Hebrew. These are the sons of God, the angels. And so that's who these are then that are lying with the women. So, you know, you might be listening to this now going, man, where's this guy coming from? This is really out there. Well, let's talk a little bit about giants. You know, if you go on the Internet, 
It's a lot like looking at end time prophecy. There is 10 times as much bad information as there is good information. There's a lot of urban legends uh, surrounding giants. Uh, some of the more recent ones is that there was uh, uh, this skeleton that was, was dug up by some Arabian men, uh, which has turned out to be a hoax. The photo was actually produced in some class where they were seeing how they could enhance and, and modify photographs. Um, it was earlier perpetuated in Greece. Um, that being said, there also seems to be some quite a bit of genuine documentation out there if you care to hunt it down about giants. Um, one source I uh, listened to on this uh, pointed out that many cultures have stories of very large men. The aboriginals, uh, for one, they say that when they came into this, the land that they are in, that there were giants there. Um, Patagonia, when it got its name, it means giant foot. And the way it was given its name is when the explorers first set foot there, one of the things they found when they got out of their ships were giant footprints. The Plains Indians claimed uh, that there were giants that lived on the plains and could run with the buffalo and could pick them up with one hand and eat them. And how this was discovered, apparently Custer uh, had somebody bring a giant bone into the camp and you know said, what is this? Custer's doctor looked at it and said, this is a human femur. And he said the size of it, uh, this individual had to be approximately 20 feet tall. So these are the kind of things that are out there. You feel free to run them down on your own. Uh, an interesting website. I didn't say it's an accurate website. You have to determine that. But it's, it's got a lot of these accounts, stories, legends, what have you, whatever you want to call them, is www.6000years.org, the number 6000. Now, here's what Snopes says about some of this stuff. And, and, and this, to me, is just as interesting as, as the legends themselves. In any case, we don't need to know the specific origins of these photos to definitively determine that they are fakes. The square cube law makes it a physical impossibility that humanoids of the size represented by these bones could ever have existed. You know, of course, those are the words of, of uh, atheistic evolutionists who write that. So <laughs> you, you, have to, you have to remember, it's, it's, it's just like people, you know, they would be the same that would say, you can't turn water into wine. Well, Jesus certainly did. Um, but here's my point, and that is that most societies uh, are replete with accounts and information about giants in their history up until more modern years, um, you know, until, until recent years. As late as the 1800s, books were still being written on it as far as cultures and, and various accounts of these giants. So, you know, I, I personally believe that when they're talking about it here, I believe that these are a, a vile offspring that produced oversized men and uh, we have giants. And, you know, this is one of the things that we see in the account uh, with David as he's fighting the Philistines. You know, and how many times do we have to look at, you know, somebody or, or Og whose bedstead was nine feet, nine inches tall or whatever it is. How many times do we see these accounts in the Bible and say there's no such thing as giants? Well, Scripture seems to keep saying that there are. So my point is, I think we can look at this and say it's giants. I don't think we have to see, think, see it as anything else. Um, chapter 14. So all the congregation lifted up their voices and cried, and the people wept that night. And all the children of Israel complained against Moses and Aaron, and the whole congregation said to them, If only we had died in the land of Egypt, or if only we had died in the wilderness... Why has the Lord brought us to this land to fall by the sword that our wives and our children should become victims? 
Would it not be better for us to return to Egypt? So they said to one another, let us select a leader and return to Egypt. And this was the birth of the congregational church. No, I'm kidding. Um, but basically, here's, here's what happened. They would rather place their trust in the Egyptian taskmaster who they knew would abuse them than in the hands of God who has shown them his faithfulness every time. Why? Because for whatever reason, that's something they know, that's something they've experienced. And, um, you know, this, this walking by faith is a, is a new thing to them. Keep in mind, Egypt is a type for the world. And often, we would rather entrust the security of our families to the taskmasters of this world than in the hands of a God who is ever faithful. We would rather work 70 to 80 hours a week to support our families, to provide for them, than to work 40 hours and trust the Lord to provide the rest. The thing is we have to remember is we have to trust the Lord not only because he's faithful but on principle because we know he is faithful even when we are faithless he remains faithful because he cannot deny himself and yes he wants us to work he wants us to be responsible he wants us to work hard he wants us to work six days a week actually if you look at scripture But he wants us to trust him. We can't look to Egypt for our sustenance. We have to look to the Lord and recognize that the Lord may choose that way to provide for us, whether it's our job or whatever it is. The Lord can provide and does provide through those things, but he doesn't want us putting our trust in the job. You know, one of the things that's interesting, I had, I had been in a, a career that was, as I was getting into it, was promised to be a very lucrative career. And one of the things that they taught was uh, having good benefits and, and corporations have a name for good benefits. It's called golden handcuffs. I mean, I, I don't care what color they are. When you're handcuffed behind your back, you can't see it anyway. You're still a prisoner, right? So don't put your trust in the world to provide. Don't put your security in the world. Put your security in the hands of the Lord. Verse 5. Then Moses and Aaron fell on their faces before all the assembly of the congregation of the children of Israel. So this is basically, they're, they're going to pray knowing that this is a rebellion and God doesn't tolerate rebellion. Verse 6. But Joshua the son of Nun and Caleb the son of Jephunneh, who were among those who had spied out the land, tore their clothes, which is a sign of mourning. And they were able... Or, or, and they spoke to all the congregation of the children of Israel, saying, The land we pass through to spout is an exceedingly good land. If the Lord delights in us, then he will bring us into the land and give it to us, a land which flows with milk and honey. Only do not rebel against the Lord, nor, nor fear the people of the land, for they are our bread. Their protection has departed from them, and the Lord is with us. Do not fear them. So Joshua and Caleb feared the Lord and the rest all feared the men, the Amalekites and the giants. And if the Lord delights in us, as he said, you know, he'll, he'll do this for us. He'll give us the land. You know, God prefers our obedience to sacrifice. And if we are going to obey him, then he will bless us. Disobedience to God is rebellion. And one of the things that we're going to see later on is that slow obedience is the same as disobedience. Now, for you Star Trek fans, Caleb knew that the Amalekite shields were down and that Israel's phasers were fully charged here. Their protection had departed from them. When God is in it, there are things that are going to happen in the spiritual realm that we cannot see that are for our benefit. God can take away those protect protections and, and he can, by our hand, cause amazing things to happen. Verse 10. And all the congregation said to stone them with stones. 
Now the glory of the Lord appeared in the tabernacle of meeting before all the children of Israel. So, you know, this wanting to stone him, I mean, this is kind of a common reaction to hearing unwanted truth. <laughs> you know, they don't want to hear it, so let's stone him, let's kill him. But I believe that what we're seeing here on God's part, this is called an intervention. And God is not happy, happy, happy. He is angry. Verse 11. Then the Lord said to Moses, How long will these people reject me, and how long will they not believe me? With all the signs which I have performed among them, I will strike them with the pestilence and disinherit them, and I will make of you a nation greater and mightier than they. So now he's saying he's going to make Moses the nation, not the children of Israel. See, so they've got this unbelief and they're rejecting God. They're not taking him at his word and so they're rejecting him along with what he has said. You know, and the thing is we saw just recently in Mark on Sunday mornings is that Jesus, when he was in his own country, could do no miracles there except he healed a few people. Why? Because of unbelief. And see, and this is the problem we see right here in the children of Israel. God is not going to take them into the promised land because of their unbelief. Verse 13, And Moses said to the Lord, Then the Egyptians will hear it, for by your might you brought these people up from among them. And they will tell it to the inhabitants of this land. They have heard that you, Lord, are among these people, that you, Lord, are seen face to face, and your cloud stands above them, and you go before them in a pillar of cloud by day and in a pillar of fire by night. Now, if you kill these people as one man, then the nations which have heard of your fame will speak, saying, Because the Lord was not able to bring this people to the land which he swore to give them, therefore he killed them in the wilderness. And now I pray, let the power of my Lord be great, just as you have spoken, saying, The Lord is long-suffering, abundant in mercy, forgiving the iniquity and transgression, but he by no means clears the guilty visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children to the third and fourth generation. Pardon the iniquity of this people, I pray, according to the greatness of your mercy, just as you have forgiven this people from Egypt even until now. So Moses now is, is pleading with the Lord, and I love the way he goes to the Lord here, because he is just acknowledging back to the Lord everything he knows about the Lord to be true. He's telling him basically, God, you're not a covenant breaker. Even when we are faithless, you are faithful because you can't deny yourself, you're God. Lord, you are mighty, you're almighty. You are merciful, but you are holy. And he acknowledges all these things back to the Lord. And then he asks for pardon. So he's not asking God to break anything he has said. He's asking, just reminding the Lord, Here, you know, here's who you are. And here's, here's your word. Here's what you said. And so here's the Lord's response. Verse 20. Then the Lord said, I have pardoned according to your word. But truly as I live, all the earth shall be filled with the glory of the Lord, because all these men who have seen my glory and the signs which I did in Egypt and in the wilderness, and have put me to the test now these ten times, and have not heeded my voice, they certainly shall not see the land of which I swore to their fathers, now shall any of those who rejected me see it. Wow. Now here he says, you know, I'm going to show mercy, but I'm also going to be true to my word. And then he says, you know, they've tempted me now these ten times. You know, and, and various sources had interesting things to say about this. Some sources said, well, now this is just figurative. Ten means the number of completeness. Another source says that uh, the, there are 10 actual instances here. If we follow uh, the rabbis or, uh, and add to the murmuring uh, at the Red Sea uh, in Exodus chapter 14, at Mara in Exodus chapter 15, in the wilderness of sin in chapter Exodus 16, at Rephidim in Exodus 17, at Horeb in Exodus 32, uh, in Numbers chapter 11, uh, Numbers chapter 11, verse 4, so twice in Numbers there, and here again at Kadesh, the twofold rebellion of certain individual against commandments. So which they can kind of torture it and get 10 times out of it, is what I'm saying. But I really don't think that's 
that's part of it, but I don't think that's in totality what this whole 10 times is about. Here's the fact. 10 spies each made an individual decision to, when they bring back the negative report, to try to dissuade the children of Israel in an act of rebellion against God. And I believe that's the 10 times that the Lord is referring to, is the 10 times of, of those 10 individuals. God is going to keep his covenant with the children of Israel, yet the nearly universal rebellion of this generation will not be excused. And even when there is forgiveness of sin, there is often still consequences. And that's what we see here now, that there's going to be consequences. Verse 32, we can finish this. As, uh, but as for you, your carcasses shall fall in the wilderness, and your sons shall be shepherds in the wilderness 40 years and bear the brunt of your infidelity until your carcasses are consumed in the wilderness. Uh, I jumped way down, didn't I? 24, yeah. But my servant Caleb, because he has a different spirit in him and has followed me fully, I will bring into the land where he went and his descendants shall inherit it. Now the Amalekites and the Canaanites dwell in the valley tomorrow or dwell in the valley, tomorrow turn and move out into the wilderness by the way of the Red Sea. And the Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron saying, how long shall I bear with this evil congregation who complains against me? I have heard the complaints which the children of Israel make against me. Say to them, as I live, says the Lord, just as you have spoken in my hearing, so I will do to you. The carcasses of you who have complained against me shall fall in the wilderness. And all of you who were numbered, according to your entire number, from 20 years old and above, except for Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, and Joshua, the son of Nun, you shall by no means enter the land which I swore I would make you dwell in. So God is saying here that he sees this different spirit in Caleb. He follows him fully. That was unusual to the children of Israel. And here they are. Now at the door of the promised land, and God is saying, okay, there's the promised land, but I'm sending you back into the wilderness. Think about it. They're just this close, and all they had to do was obey. But as a result, now they're going to wander another 38 years in this wilderness. And in that time, all of everybody there who is over 20 years old and above is going to die in the wilderness except for Caleb and Joshua. Moses himself will see the promised land, but he won't be allowed to enter it. So only those two that are over 20 years old. But in that time, there's these, uh, well, let's, let's just read on. Verse 31, But your little ones whom you said would be victims I will bring in, and they shall know the land which you have despised. But as for you, your carcasses shall fall in the wilderness and your sons shall be shepherds in the wilderness 40 years and bear the brunt of your infidelity until your carcasses are consumed in the wilderness. According to the number of the days which you spied out the land, 40 days for each day, you shall bear your guilt one year, namely 40 years, and you shall know my rejection. I, the Lord, have spoken this. I will surely do so to all this evil congregation who are gathered together against me. In this wilderness they shall be consumed, and there they shall die. Now the men of whom Moses sent to spy out the land, who returned and made all the congregation complain against him and by bringing a bad report of the land, those very men who, the evil, who brought the evil report about the land died by the plague before the Lord. But Joshua, the son of Nun, and Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, remained alive of the men who went to spy out the land. So now here's the problem. What's happening? Because of their infidelity, their children, the kids that are under 20, they're going to be shepherds in the wilderness for 40 years. So some of these guys that were 20 years old when they first entered the land are now going to be 60 when they go in. You know, there's, there's a lot of difference I'm finding between 20 and 60. I'm not there yet, but it's staring me in the face. And as I, as I see it, I know at 52, there's a whole lot of difference between this and 20. There's going to be a lot of changes that take place in these guys, a lot of maturing. And this is, a, a, this is all just because their parents 
chose to reject the Lord. The consequences were passed down to their children. You know, one of the things we have to be careful of is when we see God doing a work, yet it's in a way we may not particularly agree with, is to become a critic of that work. We have to be very careful. If God's hand is in it, we should not touch that. You know, one of the things that, that to me is a little disappointing is how many, I don't know that I'd call them teachers. I don't quite know what to call them. Well-known guys who basically have made their fame, Christian guys, by destroying ministries. I mean, by, by going around and just ripping apart good ministries where there is fruitfulness and just making, uh, picking apart small things about these various men and, and just becoming critics. You know, and the, and the thing is, as I look at the spiritual gifts in the New Testament, there is no gift of criticism. There is no gift of a critical spirit. That's not a gift. Yes, we're to be discerning. But when we make these discernments and we see that if something is wrong, that's when we have to say, well, I'm not going to do it this way because I know what God has called me to do. We have to be careful not to destroy these ministries because, you know, um, a good many of these, not all of them, some of them are hucksters, but a good many of them are our brothers in Christ and we will be spending eternity with them. We may not agree with how they do things, and that's okay. You don't have to do things with them, but don't destroy them either. You know, so I get, I have to say, I, I get a little discouraged, you know, when I, when I hear guys that have a following ripping on all these, these various ministries. Now, I'm not saying that there, are bad, there aren't bad ministries out there. There are. But the thing is, we shouldn't be perpetuating the destruction. We should just be taking that and saying, well... I'm just going to learn from that, and I want to do it the right way. That's what we should do. Verse 39, Then Moses told these words to all the children of Israel, and the people mourned greatly. And they rose up in the morning and went up to the top of the mountain, saying, Here we are, and we will go to the place which the Lord has promised, for we have sinned. Have you ever had this with your kids, where you've, there's been consequences for disobedience, they've lost their privilege, and so you say, That's it. And they, they come and say, No, no, I'll do it, I'll, I'll do it, I'll do it. This is what the children of Israel are doing right now. And Moses said, Now, why do you transgress the command of the Lord? For this will not succeed. Do not go up, lest you be defeated by your enemies, for the Lord is not among you. For the Amalekites and the Canaanites are there before you, and you shall fall by the sword, because you have turned away from the Lord, and the Lord will not be with you. But they presumed to go up to the mountaintop. Nevertheless, neither the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord nor Moses departed from the camp. Now remember, as they went into battle, it was supposed to be the Moses, the priests, and the Ark. And then the congregation, then the troops. That's how they were to go into battle. But here they're just going without any of this covering. Then the Amalekites and the Canaanites who dwelt in the mountain came down and attacked them and drove them back as far as Hormah. So basically what we see here is delayed obedience. Now they want to go ahead and obey. But it's the same as disobedience. Because now it is too late. It doesn't matter what they do. The Lord's not with them now. See, and this is the thing that, that we also have to be, be careful of in our own lives. And, and that is when God is moving and he's calling us to do something. You know, one of the things that I often hear people say is that, well, I'm, I'm just praying for the right timing. Right timing? Did God tell you to do it? Get up and go. You know, when I'm talking to my kids, you know, now they don't do the dishes. they kind of outgrown that because they all have jobs. But before they had jobs, they used to have to help with the dishes. And if I said, you know, it's time to go do the dishes, you know, a common phrase I heard was, in a minute, you know, which it really wasn't a minute. It just meant not right now. But the point is, 
I didn't ask them to do it now because I wanted them to do it in a minute. Nor does God send us to go do something and tell us he's going to do this because he wants us to go do it in a week or a year. And we should just be going about when he does that saying, okay, Lord, show me what you'd have me to do. And if there's something he wants us to do, he'd say, but first, you know, okay, well, let's set to obey. Let's not wait for God's timing. We just need to obey. 